what if I told you that this 29 year old just a few years ago was an everyday sales rep making a few thousand a month until he found a secret and that secret catapulted him to $3.9 million per month. And in this video, he shares the four things that helped to get him there so that you can achieve exactly the same and replicate his success. So let's get straight into the video and I hope that you enjoy. So, I mean, I'll just give the highlights since everybody knows for the most part. Um, basically, you know, Colin Vallejo, we have two different companies. We have a sales training company and we have a placement sales team company. Um, our main company is the B2B company that does the sales team building, sales team placement, etc. The big misconception with that company is that like we only place people from the kind of biz op type program. But no, most of the most, and this has actually always been the case, but most of the hires come from like full cycle recruiting process and the headhunting process and stuff like that. So that's really what that company is, is a, is a recruiting company at the end of the day. Uh, it is sent to the mastermind. So we have about uh, 110 people, 120 people, I would say. I don't know the exact number. Um, and then we have um, 110, 120 people. We're doing probably about 3.9 million a month right now. Uh, we should hopefully break four this month. But, uh, but yeah, so what else? No, 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 um, we, we, we can leave it at that. That 3.9 million, I would say that probably you're the leader in the space right now. When it comes to scaling up that, over that 1 million mark in the info space is kind of typically where people peak off and they either drop or they struggle to maintain it at that level. So why don't I, because what I'll do is I'll leave and we'll open up the floor with everyone, but I'd like to know, especially because I'm managing a few teams at the moment, is breaking past that one million and stabilizing it, right? What would you say or what would you advise to a team of 10 reps plus, what would you boil it down to in order to get to two million? What's really the main needle move on? You know, we, so the question is what we're million, from, from a million to two million a month? Yeah, breaking past a million. Yeah, so, uh, well, breaking past a million a month is, is you know, in a game like this is going to sound probably a little facetious, but it's relatively easy. Uh, all you need is a product that gets customers results that people want, that the people who don't know you want, right? Like, there's a difference between creating a product where you can sell on Instagram, where people follow you for a little bit, and then they buy it. Versus, uh, you know, you got to create something that works off uh, cold traffic. Cold traffic can be um, paid ads. I mean, not 98% of our industry scales to eight figures of paid ads. So, you know, a lot of people are really big on outbound right now. And, you know, for those of you who wrote that book, it's got all the lead generation methods. It's a really good book. I, I can just tell you from my experience, purely observational. I've, ne I, like, I've, I've maybe seen one company ever get past a million a month not with paid ads in, in this space, right? So, uh, you know, more or less like a paid ads game, which means you need to make the offer work from the beginning with paid ads, right? So there's that. Um, so having an offer that people who don't know you want, okay? Mm -hmm. um, the second thing would be obviously getting a marketing system down. So like, I would say one of the biggest skills, so this is getting past a million a month. I would say one of the biggest skills that people don't have in this industry is just basic copywriting. Like it's actually pretty it's insane. Um, there's a skill you could learn that literally, if you can learn it, I mean, I would say it puts you in the top one percent of the industry. Nobody learns it. Nobody even talks. I don't understand. It is the fucking weirdest thing. I mean, I have. I, I Why does that stick out to you? Say. Why does that stick out to you? Huh? Copywriting. What? Why does that stick out to you? Copywriting. Well, I, I would say. I mean, look, like. Sales fulfills on marketing and client success fulfills on sales. So really at the end of the day, like the, the copywriting and the marketing aspect of things, it's first and foremost in this industry for the most part. Um, now, if you were in different spaces, you know, I think what it comes down to is product, right? Like with school, for instance, the product is so good that it's growing 20% month over month with zero marketing and the big, every single biggest influencer in the space wants to promote it. So, uh, you know, that's why Naval Ravikant says if uh, you sell because you don't know how to market and, and you uh, 
to market, but you don't know how to create product. And so um, now in our industry, the issue is, is that it's really not, uh, it, it's hard to, unless you do a done for you service. And even if you do do a done for you service, there's some, there's some problems, but unless you do a done for you service, it's really tough to create a product that just can sustain on the word mouth, right? It's very, very, very difficult. And even if you do do a done for you service, which is like the only way, but like we do get a couple hundred thousand dollars a month, with just word mouth, right? Probably two to three hundred grand a month, whatever. Um, and we've always done that. Um, but the issue is with a done for you service, if you take on a hundred, if you want to scale it, well, if you take on a hundred clients and 95 of them get results, but five of them don't, those five are loud because it's binary. You know, it's like in their mind, it's like it either work or it didn't work, you know? So that's the only issue with a done for you service. And I feel like that, that even if you have a 90% plus success rate, that really balances out the perception of your service a lot of times in the market and, and, and certain things like that. So um, that's neither here nor there. I don't even know where I was getting to that. Copywriting. Okay, great. So yeah, I mean, it's when I was in sales, I I was always constantly trying to get better. And I got to a point where I was like, man, I'm, I'm like, I don't know how much how much better I can get. And at the time, what I thought is just like, man, well, the, the way I could multiply like, uh, multiply my skills is by becoming better at marketing and copywriting because uh, you know essentially you're just using their sales abilities but you're you're actually now getting the conversions with a uh, one-sided conversation right like you're, you're you're getting the conversions just through print it's not really print but a video right like it's just a one-sided conversation so for me I was thinking okay if I want to really get good at sales and influence and whatever um, I have like the next level of that is this. And so I started, I mean, even when I was a sales of course, I started uh, doing my company, I started studying it from a, uh, from a very early, early on time. Like I, I, that's why when I came out, like I, I, I got to a hundred grand a month in like 30 days. And it was because I, I just knew how to do that. Already. Like I knew some basic copywriting and marketing and whatever. Right? And I also knew how to sell. So, um, yeah, I and mean, I just I just build upon it. Now, why do people not want to learn? I don't know. Um, the, it, it's also like one of the most abundant resources, and uh, but like the books on it are usually really good. Like sales, there's no good books. Marketing and copywriting, at least there's some good books. Like there's a yeah. lot of good books, and they're usually really well written. Um, there's a lot of good courses on it too, because you know most copywriters are info marketers, right? So um, yeah, I mean you know, but most people. Um, they just don't take the time to really master it. And like, that's been a big part of our success, not the entire thing, but, um, you know, I can consistently like, you know, if, if you have a marketing funnel, it's kind of like being an artist. It's like, you know, you can get something to work, but you don't want to be a one hit wonder, right? Uh, like one of the things Dean Graciosi told me is like, you want to build a company, not a campaign. And so if you, if you just like, if you're unable to produce multiple hits, like you don't want to be a one hit wonder, right? Like a, like an artist. So if you're able to produce multiple hits, that's when you really could start to become a company. And like with our company, we've shifted a lot of our marketing to where we have multiple funnels that work for the same business. And it creates this anti-fragility around the business. But to do that, you have to do a company. So anyways, I think David, uh, yeah, I, I kind of got on a long rant, but the thing that uh, I think answers your question, right? is how to break past a million a month, get to two million a month, et cetera, right? So I, I've, I've talked this to clients, I've broken it down into phases, all right? So phase one is getting essentially product market fit. That's like zero to 30K a month. It's creating an offer that is specific, solves a specific problem for a specific person, specific way. It works on cold, it like is gonna be cold traffic ready even if you're not selling it on cold traffic now. It's getting people results for it. Like zero to 30K a month, that's just getting the foundation set, right? 30K a month to 100, 200 grand most likely is phase two. And what that is essentially um, validating your optimal selling system, right? So that's getting something to work on ads. So that's a high amount of innovative energy. This is where people are actually usually pretty good. It's getting a 100, 200 grand a month, getting a funnel that works, finding out how to sell it. like. Most people who start a company, that's a natural skill set to them. I mean, it's not easy, but you know, that's that's it's it's very doable. So it's really about optimizing that optimal selling system and getting that working. 
right? What is an optimal selling system? It's a consistent, repeatable way to generate opportunities, and then a consistent, repeatable way to convert those opportunities. That's it, yeah. right? And it's something that happens day in, day. It's like a conveyor belt, right? You have to get that in place, right? Uh, now, look, can you be famous on YouTube and that's your optimal selling system? Yes, but I will say you got to be more famous than you think. Right, like you got to have a significant amount of traffic, um, and in my opinion, actually, ads is just easier. To be quite frank, I mean, I, I've I've had several clients uh, with million plus YouTube followings, and, and to be honest, like the traffic they get from their uh, organic is like not. I mean, look, if you probably got a Cormozy level following, that's different. But uh, you know, a lot of times, like you think you you would think, man, I think they'd have more traffic than they do, and they really don't. Or the traffic's like really not qualified, right? And so like I, I constantly have huge influencers work with our company and they, they you know they have like 10 million people on Instagram and they want to do paid ads. Like it's like you know grass is always great on the other side. So anyways generally that system's gonna be through paid ads and you can do it in a multitude of different ways. Right? Um, it's much easier to do it in a lot of other ways when you're in a different industry. In this industry it seems like paid ads is what works the best. Cold email, cold call, I mean that stuff works we do that. But it's just hard, just million a month, but you're gonna scale that, it's pretty tough. You can get to have a pretty good market. So that's phase two. So phase two is really, uh, I used to call this make, your, make yourself rich. And then phase three, make your clients rich, right? So what that means is usually like, you are trying to figure out what the fuck you're doing, what the fuck you're doing, what the hell is going on, and you finally get product market fit, you get your optimal selling system, stuff takes off, and then once it takes off, it's like everything breaks. And so you're at like 200, 300 in a month, and you have to like really redevelop your client success systems. And so at this stage, uh, it's really like creating a scalable product. So this is where like, you know, if you were doing one-on-one -on -one coaching or some shit, like you gotta, you know, go to a hybrid based program or um, implement client success managers. And you gotta figure out a way, and just be pretty broad, you gotta figure out a way in which like, you can create a client success system to where, okay, all, all I need to do is add more support calls or add more client success managers, whatever, and I'm going to eventually get this to a million a month. Like, th th this is the system that can scale, you know? And so you need that, right? Like, you don't wanna obviously have something that continues to break. And so you almost have to have that initial scale with your marketing funnel to break it to give you the information and the feedback of what to fix. So that's what happened with us is I was doing about 100 grand a month. I was basically doing you know 150 to actually. And I, this was in 2020. I was doing everything myself, literally just marketing sales. I was doing legit everything myself. And I was doing like 200 grand a month. I had three people on my team. No, I had two people on my team, three including me. And uh, you know, I don't recommend doing that. It was it was very exhausting. And uh, I, you know, the main reason I stuck there for like probably four months is I just had a, I, I didn't know how to create a fulfillment system that could handle the capacity to continue to grow and stack on it and grow and stack on it. Once I figured that out, we went from like a uh, hundred to 500 fast. But how I figured it out was that I hired, uh, I actually removed myself from sales, brought on my uh, now who's the CEO of the company, but my first sales guy. And, um, we just exploded in revenue. It broke all the fulfillment systems and had all these clients. And I just had to figure out a way to like service these clients. And so it forced me by necessity to figure out the fulfillment system, which, uh, you know, is, is now something I teach clients, right? But back then, everybody was doing a lot of like just group only coaching and stuff. And so it wasn't really a good one on one fulfillment system model at scale. So just word it was. Uh, okay, phase three is make your team rich, all right? So phase two, or phase one was make yourself rich, phase two was make your clients rich, phase three is make yourself, or make your, make your team rich. So what happens here is in this phase, this is really, it depends on your price point, this is really where you're looking at uh, 300 grand a month to potentially a million a month. 300 grand a month to like, make sometimes six to 800, it depends on your price point. So if your price point is like 10K plus, this is 300 grand a month to a minimum month plus. And your price point is like 4,800, this might only be to six, 700 grand a month. And so at this stage, what you're really looking to do is um, 
step out of the innovative energy, right? Like you don't want to do new. You just want to do more and better, right? You guys have probably heard from those who say that, right? More and better. So at this stage, your funnel works, okay? Good. Um, you have, you're off the phone, like you need to get off the phones. You need to get a sales team, right? Obviously that's, that's a given. You need to get out of one-on-one fulfillment. You need to get CSM. Now, once you have those in place, it's literally like you're the full-time general manager of your own business and you just got to put your manager hat on and learn how to fucking manage. Now, this is where most people in this industry, they don't know the fuck to do. And like, they don't even realize that they don't know what to do. What they do is that, you know, when every, uh, when, when, uh, when all gamers, every multiple name, I think that's the thing said, right? And so, because they're, they have a marketing based skill set, usually they get to this point um, and they're doing like $3 million a year. And then, then the scale, they try to fix the problem with marketing. It's essentially, it's like all they need to do is just do more and better, train their team, and build a real organization. But then they like launch another business or they like do another marketing campaign. There's, there's a lot of people do this, right? It looked, it's very shiny objects. But it's really, a, it's really because they're not learning the skills. To, to move forward, right? And so really phase three is like, you gotta put your manager hat on, you gotta read all the good management books, you know, Patrick Lencioni's books, One Minute Manager, Unreasonable Hospitality, like you gotta read all these books and you gotta really figure out um, how you're gonna run a high performing sales team, how you're gonna run a high performing client success team, how you're going to at least have enough, they don't have to build a full stack marketing team, but you gotta like, you know, you shouldn't be running the ads yourself. So like maybe training up a tech media buyer person, one of those, having a, a EA and then op, you know, a couple of VAs for off stuff and then like a control, right? Like, so you just need like the basics and you gotta just have, figure out what's my meeting cadence in my company, how do I start setting in like mission, vision and values, um, how do I get everybody in sync and how, you know, you gotta be like the CEO, right? And so that sounds simple. Most people are just really bad at that. And, and the reason why is because at least with marketing, copywriting and sales, it's pretty easy to look out into the marketplace and find examples of what good looks like, right? With sales, like you can listen to the Davis call and you're like, okay, here's, here's a good sales call, right? Uh, with marketing, maybe you can look at, uh, something I wrote or something else that's really working in the marketplace right now. And you can kind of understand like what good copywriting is. There's also a lot of courses and stuff, uh, with management, it's very tough. And what I've found is that it's something you have to feel, not something that it's easy to learn through a book. I mean, that's the same thing with sales, right? But management even more so. What do you mean feel? Like, what do you mean feel? Because you're touching on something so big, because whenever something is going wrong at a company, I'm always seeing it's the same pattern of managerial and leadership issues, right? So, so what is it that people are not feeling or missing on that? Well, let me, let me kind of give you an example, right? So, so basically the reason why I was able to, I think we went, I think we got 2.5 million a month in 18 months. The reason I was able to do it that fast is because I came from a company doing 1.4 million a month. And I got, I got there doing like very like 300. And then we just went like, you know, to 1.5 million a month. And we went from remote to in an office. Now I'm not a big office guy, but that actually also was really helpful to me. So what happened with that experience is I just was able to literally feel and see and be a part of like what an organization looked like. And what was funny is like this company, it was TF, you guys probably know them, but they're, they're not around anymore. Um, but what's funny about this organization is like they had gone through, this was their third time trying to scale. So like they had kind of like learned all these lessons like real hard way. And then I kind of came in and I sort of like everything, them doing it the right way finally. Now, what I will say is that there's a lot of things, and this is any company you ever join as an employee, you know, there's 80% of stuff I really liked, 20% of stuff I really fucking didn't like. And then, you know, that became my company culture. You know, I took the things I didn't like and I inverted it. And the things I liked, I kept. And, you know, I kind of came up with my own values. And then so it's, you know, I, I, I kept a lot of the things that were good, but I also made it my own and, and shifted it in a way so that I had a culture I felt was a little more healthy. And um, that's just something that comes from experience. So anyways, why I grew so fast is like, I didn't realize this until after the fact. I just had that skill, you know? I just knew 
what to do. Um, and I just, you know, to me, it just seemed obvious, but I, I forget, you know, like, look, if like, if, if a lot of people in this industry are young, they maybe had a nine to five, they were like low level corporate, they were like bartending or something or blue collar work, they quit, then they get into this and they'll have a fucking build a real company. Like, how do you know? And believe me, you don't read it. You don't learn it through reading fucking scaling up, you know, like, that ain't gonna happen. So like, you know, it, 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 it's pretty tough. And I think the only thing you can do is, and this is why I think our mastermind, I'm not trying to pitch our mastermind, but this is part of the reason our mastermind is, is I think really helpful, is like you can get around a company who, who knows how to do it. Um, and, and you can start asking questions or, you know, even just trying to like, like we let some of our clients attend our meetings, like that's really good. So to answer your question more directly is, see, feel like what's, what's the difference, what's missing? Um, I think it's a couple of things that are so basic, right? Number one, uh, that mission, vision, and value stuff, like that actually matters. And so when I first started, I was like, this stuff's stupid. But it makes sense I thought it was stupid because at the phase I was in, that was phase one, right? I just needed to sell. Like that stuff doesn't matter if you don't have customers and you don't have like market work. Like who, who fucking cares, you know? So I was right in the way. It, did, it doesn't matter in the beginning. It does not matter. You're just trying to figure out what the hell's going on. It matters when you start to have a lot of people looking to you for a lead, a lead them. And so mission, vision, and values, this is how you think about it. It never made sense to me until I heard this analogy. Think about, I don't know why I always think of like the 1700s and like, you know, they were boating across like the Atlantic. So think about like your 1700s, you're boating across the Atlantic, right? And so the vision, it's like we're all getting on a boat, we're going to go on this journey. The vision is the exciting destination of where we're going, right? So back then, it's like we're going to go, you know, you know, I thought they what, what, they were going to go to India or something. But what, but there's an exciting destination that they're going to be going, right? So that's the vision. The mission is why we're going where we're going, okay? So it's the why behind where we're going. It's not just where, it's why, all right? And then the values is how we're going to interact with each other on the journey and going where we're going, okay? And so having alignment with those three things, it's like getting everybody in unison, getting everybody in sync, and it's almost like everybody's rowing in the same direction at the same time, all, all on the same page, right? It's very, very, very key. And you know, when you're interviewing somebody, you need to be able to establish, um, you need to be able to establish, okay, is this person somebody that we want to take on this journey? with us, right? Like, or not. And, and, and you got to be very, very clear too, like what the journey of mission, vision, and values, and hey, like here's how we interact with each other on the journey. Is this going to be right for you? Because like, if not, don't, don't hop on the boat. And so when this looks really good, it's like everybody's rowing in sync. That's the thing I think about. But when this looks really bad, it's like, imagine all the employees as like rowers on the boat. You got like some people sleeping, some people are rowing this way, some people are rowing this way. Like, Somebody's going backwards. Somebody thinks they're going north. Somebody thinks they're going south. Uh, like it's 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 not in sync. It's not in unison. Nobody's on the same page, right? So that at a meta level is what you need to do. And the the best way to keep it, to keep establishing that is to have monthly team wide meetings, to where you just get everybody in sync. You you repeat the same. And you got to be repetitive. Like you just say the same damn thing again and again and again. And again. That's good leadership for that kind of stuff, right? And so, uh, what else are people missing? The main thing is uh, meetings get villainized. And yeah, bad meetings are not good. But you want to have a lot of good meetings. And so, in the beginning, you might, like what I did in the beginning, is I just have one meeting a day with everybody in the company on the meeting. That was it. You have one meeting a day, everybody in the company on the meeting. My meeting is at like noon or something. So, one meeting a day, everybody in the company. Then eventually, usually the first thing to break out is the sales team. So it's like the sale. It, it, and look, that one meeting a day, everybody in the company, is it productive to everybody at all times? No, but fuck it. Like, just do it. Okay. Uh, and honestly, people really like it. They're like, like back in those days, it was just like, you know, we had eight people. So it was like, it just felt badass. Like, we could get everybody on a meet once a day and all interact with each other. And it was like, we were very agile. Like, it was, it was cool. I kind of missed that in some way because I don't think we got to work out, but you know, it, it was cool. Uh, then the first, then what needs to happen usually is the, the sales team needs to break out on its own daily meeting. 
because if, you know, you're doing a lot of training, you're doing a lot of call reviews and like that's too much. So then the sales team needs to break out on its own meeting daily, right? And then usually after that, the fulfillment team needs to break out on its own meeting. And then now you have ops, marketing, finance, um, fulfillment, sales. And then eventually the marketing needs to break out on its own meeting. And then that, that structure is more or less, um, you know, what, what you're going to use for a while, especially if we circle back and we go to the phase three. Right, so it's having a daily meeting. Now, what's happening on the meetings? You gotta withhold standards, you gotta withhold the values, you gotta make sure there's good communication, you gotta make sure people show up professionally, you gotta make sure that everybody's on their laptop, everybody has their camera on, everybody shows up on time, like basic stuff, right? And you gotta make sure everybody's self-aware, everybody knows their numbers, if they're not on track with the numbers, why are they not on the numbers? Like there's no awareness there. And then you gotta know how to run the meeting, right? Generally, it depends on the, how you're in the meeting, it depends, but the very basic structure, like I'll, I'll tell you the marketing meeting. It's, we look at, we, we do wins in the beginning. Then after that, we do um, we do all the KPIs. We look at every channel, every funnel. We look at KP, all the KPIs down the list. And we look at the sales KPIs because that affects the marketing team. And then after that, that takes, that takes probably like 20, 30 minutes depending on the day. Then we look at all of our projects in Asana and we just go through one by one by one and check up on where everything's at. Very, very simple. Then if we have any time left over, we'll do some sort of a training. And so that's like a copywriting training or I'll, somebody will bring an ad to review, I'll tear it apart, like stuff like that, right? So the same way you train your sales team, you train your other You want to do the same thing with fulfillment, right? And so anyways, but I digress. Hope that answers your question. Phase three is make your team rich. You got to be full-time manager for your company. Okay, phase four is make your leaders rich. Okay, so in this phase, you're the full-time manager of your company, but now your direct reports, like you got like 15 direct reports, that's way too much, or 18 or something like that, stupid. And um, you need to start bringing up player coaches, or really you should have been already doing that. But really in this phase, you need to start bringing up people to manage the departments, right? Departmental managers. This part also people suck at, right? And this part, it, this part genuinely is hard. I, I will say. Department managers. Uh, Department managers. Is huh? Well, promoting and hi, hi, finding, hiring, and promoting managers, and also like it's hard because most people aren't good at managing to begin with, and then since they're not good at it, they don't know how to hire and train and hold accountable a good manager either. Does that make sense? So. It's a tough part for people in this industry, and quite frankly, this industry has it a little bit tougher because because we're so dependent on ads, we have this tight margin in which we need to make things work profitability-wise. And so we can have a very profitable cash flow business if the teams are if the teams are performing very efficiently. Uh, but the problem is, is like when you start to hire managers, it's really tough to have the same efficiency as when you're doing it. And a lot of times people will do that, these organizations, they get shittier. And then um, from there, we just, you know, they, they just really struggle. So anyways, phase four, make your leaders rich. What you got to do now is, you know, hire, and, and this is gradual, right? You don't do this all at fucking once. But it's like, hire a sales manager, you hire a client success director. You um, probably still are in charge of the marketing team. That's probably fine. Um, you hire like more of a, Somebody to like lead your finance department. It doesn't have to be a CFO, a controller, and they just manage a couple of like basic VAs. So you gotta make sure that's in place. Um, you probably need like an ops manager to manage some ops VAs, or that could be the same as the finance person, right? That's fine too. So you gotta have like, you, you gotta build the first remnants of your C-suite team, okay? Now, to go back to the very original question I was asked, how do you get past a million a month? Well, that's how it's those phases. So keep in mind, the marketing and the innovation is really only in the very beginning. Once you hit that first base hit, like you got that, you released a, a track that's hidden, you know, it's, it's on the billboards. You just want to ride that sucker as hard and as long as you can. And really, to be honest, most of the scale will come from making these units like your sales team and your fulfillment team and your back end conversion very efficient and just pouring into those teams. And then as you pour more into those teams, the leaders, the leaders you might need or may need will rise out of them. And you need to get, create competitions in which people are 
hey, you know, we're going to need a sales manager by the end of this year. Couldn't you guys. So like uh, you're all competing for it. So you need to to start building that. Now, once you get to um, a million a month, getting to two million a month. I mean, to be quite frank, it, depending on your price point, um, it really at the end of the day is just more and better. So like if you're let's say you got a 10k price point and then you have a or um, the 35k backend, right? That's that's pretty conservative. So if you have a 10k price point, the 35k backend. If you have four reps closing, uh, what would that be? 25. Okay. So this is another key thing. This is a total aside. With your sales teams, I would really recommend trying to get your reps to close at least 15 units a month, but preferably more than 20 units a month. Preferably, preferably, this is much harder but this is what we do, is like 25 to 35 minutes. Because you want to get the most out of your sales reps as possible uh, before hiring another rep. Now, at a, I, I would I would try to get the two reps as fast as possible. That way, if one quits, you're not back on the phone. But like after that, it's really like, I would rather have eight reps producing 20 units a month apiece than 16 reps producing 10. Yeah. That's obvious, right? Like. You know, I'm gonna have to spend less on ads, and I'm gonna have better reps because they're making more money. They're not gonna leave. I'm gonna have lower churn. I'm more likely to have the manager I need come come to the organization because again, I'm attracting better people. You guys see what I mean? So like, this, and, and it's also way easier to manage eight people than sixteen people. Duh. It's like less operational complexity. So that's another thing as well. Is that what you, what you really want to do is it's like think of each rep as a building block. You want to max out the building blocks as much as you can before you before you stack the other blocks. And so, going back to really what I was saying, a million a month, or uh, you know, let's say you have a 10k product, 35k back end price point. If you have four reps at selling a 10k product, if they're each doing 25 units a month, that's a million a month front end. Now we're going to collect all that, maybe down, but let's just let's just say easy now, million a month front end, okay? Then let's say out of that, you have a 20% backend conversion with your CSM team. That could even be better, but that's pretty conservative. It's kind of middle of road. So with that, 20%, that'd be 20 units, 20 units times, so that'd be an extra 700 grand a month revenue. So revenue-wise, you'd be at 1.7 million. Cash-wise, you're probably at 1.25, 1.3. .2. Okay? So if you're at four reps, 100 units a month. I mean, you could easily probably double that, keep back end conversion the same, uh, stack on with your CSM team, continue to make back end conversions better, maybe raise your back end price, spend more on ads, and get to 2 million a month. It's just more and better of the same thing. Now, uh, to do that, you're really going to have to have with me because you're, you're, you're sure as fuck not going to be able to do that yourself. But really, it just, it's just better, right? But, Price point, higher price point in this industry helps a lot. It helps a lot. Because uh, once you get past about eight, eight, eight reps on the front end and about eight to ten coaches, uh, it's pretty tough. Like, I mean, you know, now your managers are tapped out and like you got yeah. either they have higher co managers and like it's, it's, you know, so it's just another level of like middle management, which creates another risk of inefficiency. So, you, you know, I would try to get to like two million a month ish, maybe a little bit more, uh, by maxing out price point, maxing out what you're getting from every rep, maxing out what you're getting from ads, maxing out your back end conversions, and trying to stay with that one middle manager. Like that's kind of where that's at, right? And so, anyways, phase four can took take you all the way there. Now, phase five is what I call reinvention. And so uh this is what I was really in now, and this is what I think it gets you, gets you to uh, from, let's call it maybe 10 to 25 million. Sorry, I said 10 to 25 million to 30 million, 50 million, potentially uh, more, you know, 100 million. And so uh, reinvention is where, remember, in the very beginning to get all of this started, we, what we wanted to do is, God damn. What we wanted to do is we we're, we're highly innovative, right? We're creating a marketing funnel that's going to scale, essentially. 
okay? That's the very beginning is we're in that innovative energy. What's funny is that gets us to 200 grand a month, 200 like a million a month, sometimes 2 million a month. I'm not saying there's no innovation, but there's really like, it's more of like more, better, improving, managing, leadership, like stuff like that. But eventually it does come back around to where you sort of have your C-suite team and now you need to sort of come back into the marketing hat and the innovation hat to either create new funnels, create new campaigns, or maybe even new offers to scale further, okay? Um, sometimes this is not necessary. I mean, you mentioned like, I was one of the in the space, to be honest, there's a guy who I know doing eight million a month and it's just one funnel, dude. It's like, wow. it's like literally one funnel, one sales team, one, and it just tons of people. Like, that's it, you know? So you almost don't even need to do that. But I, I have found, you know, at a certain point, and if you read Ready Fire Aid, it's, it's very similar. You, you may want to start being more prolific with, like, instead of having one funnel that leads to your sales team, you have two funnels. And you need to maybe make that two sales teams, one for each funnel. They still go to the same fulfillment team, you know? They still have the same back. Uh, so stuff like that. I mean, obviously, having two offers can help. Um, but you're creating two businesses doing that. So I would just be wary. I don't, I don't necessarily recommend doing what I did. Uh, I also wholeheartedly think if I would have had one company instead of two, I'd be at the same level of revenue. Like I think I could, if I had my B2B company and that was all I focused on, we'd probably be at four million less. Ago. You know, we would just be bigger. That's so a, that's interesting um, that you say that because one of the things that I felt that you always did very well was the products and services that you put out in the market kind of fed into each other, you know? So it was almost like, yeah. it wasn't connected, but it was connected. Yeah, a, yeah. so, you know, that sounds good, and that's, it, it makes me seem smart, but uh, quite frankly, um, I don't think it helps as much as people think. So a couple of things. Remember in the very beginning, I, I was saying that there's a big misconception. Like, most of the reps we place don't even come from the certification program. They come from full cycle headhunting. And we've done that from day one. So there's a big misconception uh, with our service. Now we do place a lot of those people, but most of the certification people get placed as like the inner level outlets. So like very rarely do they get placed as closers from my understanding. Uh, I'm sure it does happen, but you know, sometimes the certification people do have experience. You know, the certification, these people don't have experience. I'm not gonna put them in a most yeah. times, right? And so uh, most of the 60 to 70 percent, 75 percent come from full cycle recruiting. So if, if that program went away, the B2B would be fine. It, it, we would just do more full cycle recruiting. And it ran for a year by itself without the full cycle or without the certification. So um, it's not, you know, it does leave, it, seem, it seems flywheely, but it's really not, mm -hmm. to be quite frank. Right, right, uh, right. The other thing is, is, uh, is um, I will say my biggest challenge has always been running to fucking things. Like it sucks because you're in this constant battle of like trying to make one thing good. And then once it's like, it's good. And then the other thing goes to mediocre, at least by my stance, right? And then you're like, okay, let me raise this mediocre to good. And then this one falls to mediocre. And then you're like, you know, so, but above good, there's great. And I feel like I've never gotten either one as good as I could possibly get, you know? Um, and I've also stressed myself out. Wait, like, I mean, dude, my stress, it wouldn't, be, if I had one company, it wouldn't go down by 50%. It would probably go down by 80% because it's just like, it's wow. so much easier. You book a day, you don't have the context change. So like, I mean, the, the, the truth is, I just am so deep into this model that, uh, and you know, I have, you know, I don't want to lay out 40 people, right? And so, uh, you know, and also like I have really great leaders, right? Like I'm not thinking, I would never consider shutting it down because, you know, at this stage I've been able to track such good people to where I'm, I don't, it doesn't really require me to run those things, but if I have to start all over, I mean, I'm not, I'm not sure if I'd still do it that way. Hey guys, we're going to get straight back to Cole's talk in just a second. Uh, but for those of you wondering where this is even taking place, uh, he's speaking at my Dubai boardroom mastermind event that takes place every six months uh, here in Dubai. This is where just 15 high level entrepreneurs gather to share ideas and discuss what's working right now in the realm of, of online business 
at a six, seven, eight, and even nine figure per year level. If you want to join me at the next uh, The Dubai Boardroom event, head over to www.thedubaiboardroom.com. Uh, the link is, is in the description as well, and you can see if there's any tickets left uh, for the next event. But please be quick, because as you've just seen, we can literally only fit 15 people in the room. Every single event that we've ever run has sold out. So if you do want to come and join us, again, head to the website, head to the link in the description, and reserve a ticket now. Anyway, back to the video. Okay, but I'm glad I did, and I attracted great people in the process, and it all worked out. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, so that's phase five, right? I think phase five can get you big. Now, look, um, in an info education-based company, here's what I've seen. Unless you're mega famous, okay? Mega, mega famous, right? Andrew Tate, okay? Something like that. Um, the top end of what I've seen is like 100 to $200 million a year. Okay, um, Grant Cardone, uh, you can kind of argue ClickFunnels there. It's a little bit of a, you know, hard, it's like a software plus coaching thing. But Cardone, um, really, really that's the one I look at for the most part, unless I'm, unless I'm missing somebody. I mean, there's the one that's, there's another one that I know that's like 10 million a month and it's just basically a webinar, but um, generally like services, you, you know, that's what you're looking at. And the difference there is that a lot of it runs event based. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the companies like that, like I can solve car adventures. And so I've worked with their sales teams and all this, all this stuff. You know, they're crushing it. I, I think they're doing maybe above nine figures now. I don't know. Everything all cardoing together is way above nine figures. And uh, they sell at really high price points and they sell events, you know, and then they sell at the events. So it's an event based model. That seems like it's what really helps scale, but man, that's a grind. Right, like, right, right. yeah, that is the grind of all grinds, and you're not selling that. So, um, you know, that, that's what I've seen. Now, I think you can be prolific enough. If you figure out, I mean, in info, there's billion-dollar companies, Golden Info, Agora. So if you're prolific enough and you can um, continue to put out offers, and optimize the back end and have good upsells and cross sells. You can certainly get there, uh, and coaching will be a part of that. But a lot of it is going to be like a lot of information, some events. You know, Tony Robbins, you know, I think they're about 100 million as well. Similar thing, you know, they have a lot of products. So that that's kind of what it looks like. Is it the best model to get to a billion? Probably not. I wouldn't say. Like, I don't think anybody argues that. So I would say, like, in phase six, and this is kind of the phase I'm in now. Is it's not like I am uh, I'm um, gonna leave my company or stop focusing on it, but it's how do you apply the skill sets you gain with this educational service based marketing heavy industry, and how do you apply that to a billion dollar opportunity to be right? And so um, that's really the game, like you know, and you look at all the top people in the industry. I mean. Sam Evans, that's what he's done. You look at Hormozy, that's what he's done. You look at Alex Becker, that's what he's done. So that's really the phase that I'm looking to kind of, even Cardo, you know, like real estate. Um, he's not focused on his info business, but he's focused on real estate and he's focused on his health business because those have massive, massive markets, right? And so, um, you know, the next phase is how to take your skills and put them into a bigger opportunity vehicle and you really want to do it using what's called the one step away rule. Uh, now, I, you know, again, like, um, you don't have to do this. I, I'm just getting this from Mark Ford, and Mark Ford has created a billion dollar company. So, um, a great example of the one step away rule is what Alex Becker did with Hyros. He took all of the same skills, same market, same sales process, same marketing process, everything, but instead of courses, he sold software, right? Right, And so you see how that's one step away. What's not one step away is like doing an Elon Musk for your, I mean, you know, I guess, I guess he's stayed in technology and engineering and tech for the most part, but you know, look like if you were an info company and then all of a sudden you're going to create a, uh, you know, a, I don't know, like a steak online delivery service or something like that. Like that's that's totally different type of things, 
right? Or if like you're uh, an education company and you're go to a totally different industry, fintech, and create like an app for corporate enterprise stuff. I'm not saying you can't do that because plenty of people do and they're successful. I'm just saying like, you know, in general, if you have the preference, it's nice to go one step away. You know, you with Sam Evans, it's, uh, you know, he, he's not doing anything that's like necessarily uh, high ticket, right? Right, right? But it's the same industry yeah, that he knows really well. And guess what? He also started a software company way back in the day and learned all these skills of how to build an app, right? And now, those, like, so his skill stack is actually perfect for what he's doing. And, you know, sure, there was a jump in skills and he's learned a lot, I'm sure. But, like, he was ready for that. Just. Does that make sense? So um, I do have another venture that I'm, I'm working on that's gone from zero to 10 million in a year, less than a year, like six, six seven months. I think it can do easily to 500 million a year. And uh, this is your new venture you're talking about? Huh? This is your new venture you're talking about right now? Yeah, yeah. So and then my goal is to get it to, you know, several billion. So we'll see. Is that something that's possible so that, or are you working on? First question with a, a uh, 48 minute model. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, we had that, that was like a master class, man. Like, yeah, like I had so many questions, but I don't know how much time we have left. Uh, I'll think maybe I'll just open up for everybody just to ask any questions you have. Yeah. Um, we're really grateful for the time, Cole. Anybody want to shoot anything at Cole right now? Yeah, please. Um, Cole, can, can you hear me okay, by the way? Yeah. Yeah, yeah awesome, awesome, man. Um, so I just wanted to ask you, if you don't mind, what didn't you like about traffic and funnels? You said some stuff was wrong. I, I want to try and learn from maybe what they were doing wrong. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I mean, it was just some basic stuff. Like, and look, dude, like I don't even, you know, I was bitter when I left for sure. And I was like, kind of, you know, I, I, I wasn't talking shit publicly, but like, you know, I was bitter, right? And then, uh, you know, in hindsight, you're just like, dude, like, People were just trying their best with what they had. And that's like not that big a deal. But um, look, so just big little stuff. Like what was good was that company had extremely high budgets to pay. Holy shit. Mm. What's, what's not as good is like it was almost like too high, you know, to where like there was so much extreme ownership, almost to where it got a little gaslighting. So there was that. Um, they're like, we didn't do any one on ones, you know? So, like, there was not a lot of like, there's a lot of group and like team meeting wise, those run very well. Uh, there was no one on one personal development, you know? There was no like, let's meet every week, see where you're at, see what the, you know, like, there was none of that. There wasn't a lot of developing personal relationships with your, with your leaders as much as here. Um, yeah, I mean, that was the, that, that, the, there's just a lot of toxicity as well. And a lot of it just came down to, um, you know, just extremely high, in some ways, unrealistic standards and constant gaslighting and turning everything away. to like, it's like gaslighting stuff into extreme ownership, but sometimes actually in a way it's like, if you have this unreasonable extreme ownership about yourself, it does help you. But over, over a long time horizon, it really burned. And so the chirp really, really fucking high. We didn't have any mission, vision, and values. We didn't have team offsite. We didn't have a one. It was like a lot of that stuff, you yeah, know, yeah. Is, is what we really didn't have. And, and, and all things considered, like, I'm sure those guys, if they start their next company, they'll have all those things. You know, I think at the end of the day, they had never, like, I at least had the luxury of being there and then learning from it. And then, then when you read the books, everything makes more sense. And then it's like, okay, I can, I can, and I wasn't perfect in the beginning either. It's still very imperfect. Uh, but yeah, so you kind of take that and, you know, hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, I, I see. Just one more for you, Cole. Um, do you ever kind of intend on exiting any of the uh, the companies right now? I, I know you mentioned the new one that you're building you want to sell, but the current one, the sales training and so on and so forth, any plan for an exit or? Yeah, I don't know. Um, yes, it's not necessarily on the, on the time, like, if, if I wanted to, you know, it takes a while to get ready, right? And so, um, yeah, I haven't really engaged in any discussions about that. I think what would be more likely for me is if I 
exit it, right? It'd be more of an exit of my time into more of a chairman role than it would be like get a three X EBITDA type of thing. Yeah. You know? Um, or it would be selling a portion, like a minority or majority, staying on just to do like the events and stuff and some, some basic stuff here and there, uh, just to support and still getting dividends, but you know, not having a lot of the risk, like taking it's just like, not on the risk, you know. It would probably be like something like that, but you know, I haven't really decided. I'm not really in a rush. Like right now, I mean, right now, the thing is, is even though I have another thing, um, this is still the tremendous. I mean, this is still way more income for me, and it's a lot of income. And so, you know, I don't want to fuck that up. Like, you know, it's like I'm, I'm, I'm stacking. <laughs> Hundred percent. All right. Well, do just one very, very, very quick question for you. Obviously, I was in your mastermind for a year, and it was fucking awesome. You gave me a lot of help and, and made me a lot of money. Are you in any other masterminds right now at all? Yeah, a bunch. Um, so Tom Brown's mastermind is good. That one's really a marketing focused mastermind. Like, I'm probably the biggest business owner in there, but like. I don't really join it for that. I, I join it because he's he's the go when it comes to teaching marketing. Now he's not going to show you necessarily how to build a funnel that works for y'all's businesses today. You know, like he's he's from a different era, but from fundamentally understanding and learning marketing and direct response, he's the best. Yeah. So I I, I just like he's I love that guy. Like he's he's the man. So his, his thing is really good. I highly recommend it. I've stayed in it for a while. Uh, then Driven with Perry Belcher and uh, Jason Flagley and those guys. Like, again, like, I'm not going to go there and learn. Uh, I mean, those guys have done a lot of money. Like, Jason's done a shit fuck of money. But, the, you know, in terms of, like, operating and building, like, a beast of a company, um, I don't really go there for that. Like, you're not going to learn, like, leadership tactics. I more so go there for like those guys are really savvy with like marketing and stuff. So I, you know, a good way to stay in the cutting edge of like good marketing tactics and things that are working is to go to those things. And that's actually like one somebody who really changed my perspective a lot. Is I met at one of those events and he was doing like eight million a month, two hundred units a week. And I was like, dude, I got to study what this guy did. I've never seen anything like this. And that was in the he's in the health space. Okay, and so uh, with with basically not weight loss, but like a version of health coaching. So all these health coaches were like, "Oh my god, you sucks!" And then they start teaching other coaches how to be coaches. I'm like, dude, like I'd stick with that. I'd stick with the health coaching. Like it's just the best. And if, if you're good, most people are terrible. So um, yeah, in that one. Uh, the other one I'm in is a hundred million mastermind, which. Uh, with Dan Fleischman, that one's a little different. That one's got like all sorts of business owners in it. It's like, you know, you got uh, VCs and and real estate guys and hedge fund guys and like um, some info people and like some influencer people. So yeah, that one, you know, you may get I may get some tactics here and there, but generally that one's just a interesting one to get some good connections and meet some people that are bigger influencers and um uh, and uh yeah so it, it's pretty fun they have like performances and stuff but you know i would recommend like if you if you're if you join a bunch of masterminds go i join too many and i, I never can go so i i just watch the fucking course yeah but at one point i was in, in 2021 i think i was in nine masterminds oh, on, only nine <laughs> Only nine. Yeah, I was just going all out, but that was before I had my own events. Once you, once you have your own events, it's like, you know, good. It's, it's tough. Yeah, amazing. Thanks so much. I've I've got a quick one. Uh, nice to meet you, Carl. My name's Alex Elaine. Uh, question is: Do do you prioritize for profitability uh, at the at your back end over your front end? And I'd also just like to know how your back end offers are structured. Yeah, I mean, well, uh, I'm not too sure. Is there uh, what, what's happening in your business that's prompting you to ask this question? 
Uh, so my offer is to transition traditional salespeople into a career in SaaS sales. So there's, of course, we, we charge them at the front end to do that. And then there's a, a placement service at the back end. And so I'm uh, one of the questions in my mind has been price point at the front end, whether we should be optimizing to get as many people through the door as we can at the front end so that we have more placement fees basically at the back end or whether we should just be as thoughtful at both ends to maximize profitability. Yeah, yeah, you want to be thoughtful on both ends with that. I mean, like, overall, with that B2C type of offer, um, you really want, a lot of it's going to be a front end game, you know? Like, everybody talks about the back end, this and that. With that type of offer, dude, like, it's, it's really a front end game. Now, if you put a lot of effort into it, you can figure out a way to create a full back end, and that's going to help you out tremendously. It does really help. But I, I would never like approach it like, okay, you know, our profitability is going to come from the back end. Like, no, not with that offer. You need to really make sure that in high ticket in general, like, yes, but the back end really fucking helps profit. But you should be making money in the front end, hands fucking down. Like, no, no doubt about it, hands down. You should be making a lot of money in the front end, hands fucking down. So, um, you know, it's it's kind of a both thing. Um, and then the back, I mean, and you know, with your back end too, you could do the placement. Um, you know, so it's like those guys paying for placement. I will say, like, in my opinion, you know, what are you to charge them five k or something? I mean, like. You know, because if okay, if it's if, if it's reps and if it's sales reps and they want to get into SaaS, but, you know, those people don't have a ton, a ton, a ton of money, and so what I'd avoid is doing the place thing and charging like five k. I mean, even like ten k sometimes is, is just you know it's, it's dicey. So uh, just just be wary of that because you don't want to add a bunch of operational complexity for not a lot of you know bang for your buck, right? And and you'd be surprised a lot of these folks. Well, join a mastermind with two events a year and more in-depth coaching and, you know, whatever, and, 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 and cultivating a really good community for like 15 to 20 grand. That's what we do. You're probably going to 10 to 15% conversion on that. And so, you know, maybe do something like that and then bolt in a placement service into that. That way, you know, you can charge more money for it. Just don't charge like five, five grand. Thanks, Carl. Super helpful. So, I got more time if you guys want to keep going. Whatever you guys want to do. Um, yeah, we've, we've still got half an hour to play with, so we can go, go a little bit longer. Yeah, I was going to ask um, when you, before when you said specific problem, specific person, specific solution, um, I was wondering if you could just explain your specific problem, person, and solution for the recruitment and for the sales training. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's a great, it, it, it's specific problem, specific person, specific way, right? So with the, uh, with the B2B service, we really, really have a specific problem and a specific person because like the way is that we just guarantee the results and, you know, we have a bunch of social proof, right? Like if they're building mechanisms, so as much. Um, but that's, you know, we, we can do that because we were kind of like the, well, sort of the category king of that. And so what, what you is, can, what you, is the actual solution yeah. though? What's the, what's the actual service? Uh, yeah, well, let me answer your question. I'm going to answer your question by doing my other one. So, okay. um, with the B2C offer, the certification, the specific problem, okay. Specific person is people who want to make money online. The specific problem is they can't find the best way to make money online. They do stuff like, you know, Amazon, drop shipping, whatever. The specific way is through remote closing. So the way I do that is I have a market that is primarily wanting to do what's popular on YouTube, right? Which is Amazon, drop shipping, affiliate marketing, a bunch of other bullshit, right? So that's, that, that's the existing desire. Okay. And what I do is I channel that desire into my new opportunity to create demand. Okay. 
So that's something you can read about in Breakthrough Advertising. But basically, it's I'm taking an existing parade, but putting a B-Corp post to my new opportunity. Because really, there's not a lot of search volume out there for people wanting to become high-tech developers. It's actually much better now than it's ever been. But, uh, and that's great, that's good for me. But you'd rather have people actively looking for something opposed to not, and then you have to convince them too. <laughs> but much bigger market for people just looking, trying to make money online in general. And so um, I tap into that and I have to beat for them over here, right? Whereas if you sell Amazon, you can kind of like, I mean, a lot of companies, I mean, Amazon FBA are struggling right now, but uh, if you do Amazon FBA, at least for the past couple of years, like you can just say, like, want to learn Amazon FBA. Like people, there's an act, like the search volume is like really high. It's like 80,000 searches a month on YouTube. So whereas remote closing is like 2,000. You see what I mean? So you have to you have to channel the demand. So that's why my specific method, that's why instead of saying my specific person is a remote close, person who wants to get into remote closing, the problem is they have no experience. The way is through a special methodology that I have in an academy. I, I actually go, I chunk it up one level. Does it make sense? For the specific person, if somebody wants to make money online, the problem is there's all these different ways and they all start, they all require starting a business. It's all very complex and they just want to make 10K a month. And so my methodology actually is a new opportunity, which is becoming a closer. I'm introducing that for the first time to that to the different audience. Does it make sense? Yeah, no, 100%. Um, yeah. And then, so you've explained the, the kind of front end, the, the sales training side. Um, when you're going towards, I don't know as much about your B2B offer. Um, when you're going to businesses and, and offering to put salespeople in their business, um, could you kind of explain the specific target person, their problem, and the, and the solution, how you kind of, how, how much do you charge for that as well, if you don't mind asking? So this is for the B2B service? Yeah, the B2B side, yeah, yeah. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, it, it's anywhere, so like the mastermind is 68K, but the front ends are anywhere from 12 to 24. There's a few factors that depend on that. And then essentially, it's it's people in the coaching. It, it's anybody really who has a remote phone sales team that sells a high ticket product, okay, with, with, with lead flow. Like, that's really it, you know? So primarily, though, coaches, agencies, uh, people in health is good, too, like, those are kind of the main verticals. And you said uh, that. Whatever. And then so a lot of times, like the primary offer is they don't have appointments and they want appointment setters. Or they have they have a lot of appointments that are doing all the sales calls themselves and they want to get off the scale sales calls, put in closers and scale their company. Mm -hmm. So it's one of those, right? If we do that, we're fully guaranteed for free. Does that answer your question? Yeah. So um, if, if you had to start with one of those would you start with the b2b or would you start with the b2c and um, well it depends on experience level man so like if i was a really really good sales rep and um yeah let me just say this if i was a good sales rep and i was a good, really good at sales and i wanted to start a company again um the b2b i mean dude the b2b well you know, it's hard to answer the question, right? I wouldn't start the B2B because it's really tough to, number one, compete with me and then all the other people copying me. It's very tough. I mean, I cannot tell you, dude, how many times I see people start a B2B like mine and uh, they just do it for three months and they stop. I mean, it's just like there's a graveyard of people that have done that. And it's tough. Like, there's a lot of, there's a lot of intricacies to it that uh, are hard to explain. Um, the sales is very tough. The sales is very, very, very tough. But thankfully, I'm good at sales. So, um, most people don't know how to sell. It. Most people can't sell it for the right price point. And then we have we have a great back end that helps a lot too. And then also the operational complexity of the full site recruiting team is also very tough because you can't you can't place you can't do two like I did and place solely from the certification because those people don't have any experience. So you have to do full cycle recruiting. And that's very hard. That's very complex. And to be honest, like I bitched and like when we were building that, I bitched daily about how much I hated it. Because I was like, this is stupid. 
fucking all this work, so complex, never going to scale. But then, you know, we kept getting all these word mouth and referrals. And so, like, you kind of just add the scale by necessity. And then once you have, like, a whole team in place, it's not as bad because you don't have to deal with it. So, um, you know, that, that offer is tough, but it is, a, it is my better offer. But for somebody new coming into it, would I recommend it again? Probably not. Whereas the B2C, if you go after, I mean, th there's a huge market. So because the market is so big, you do not have to worry about the competition near much. So that helps you. Uh, also, because the market is so big, advertising is much easier. Now, sales are much easier too. I'll be at, you gotta, the only thing you gotta overcome with sales is just like getting people on the phone with money and then just making sure you close people who generally like don't have enough money, right? But then the fulfillment is also very easy because every single person is coming in from the same source with the same problem, with the same goal every single time. That really helps you productize fulfillment. It's much easier to do that. Whereas the rep we're creating, it's, you know, even though it sounds like replacing a rep every single time, it's not like that. Because if you have a beginner hiring their first closer, that's a totally different client journey than somebody who's going from six closers to eight closers. Like that beginner, if we don't teach them what to do with the sales team, if we don't show them like do this, do this, do this, do this, no, don't do this, no, don't do this, and we, we check up with they, they're, they're gonna turn the closer. They won't succeed. That's another huge issue with the B2B, is it's very tough. Like the most of the problems come from the clients. Like they just don't know what to do, they never build a team, it's not a fault. So that's that's partly like we have to build that into the clients. So the B2C is much easier to do if you can get people on the money. Uh, get people with money on the phone and uh, learn how to post people who generally don't have money. That's 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 the only issues with that that offer, you know. And it's 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 much easier to get asked to work. Um, yeah. So hopefully that answers your question. No, that was really good. Um, just one last one was um, why do you think that your training uh, doesn't kind of link through to the B two B and why do you, and you use a full cycle recruiting instead? Why, why is the disconnect there? Well, no, I mean, just, just, and it's not the training, right? What it is, is if you have, I market to people with no experience. Even if I market to people with experience, it doesn't matter. Like, I've done that. It, they, they still suck. So, um, you know, these people have no experience. And so they come in, they, and, and, and look, like, they go through videos, and yeah, those videos are going to help, but like, is it going to make you good at sales? No. So they also go through a lot of role plays and a lot of like, uh, you know, uh, pairing up with a partner and then working one on one with a coach. Like it's a one on one based program. So like there is like real time stuff that they get in there. But again, like if they do fifty mock calls, which is kind of like what we try to have them do, it's still not a live sales one, right? So with those people, they're good. In terms of if they go to a role where it's just outbound and they're like cool call, right? Like, hey, call these book buyers, make some sense. That's a great start for those people. Because what I will say about the certification people is like they pay 10K and you put them in an outbound role. The, the on-track earnings could be fucking four grand long. But you put them in that outbound role, it is a hard role, but goddamn, like, they are so fucking committed. They're like, I'm going to, like, this is my shot. I'm going to make this work or die trying. Like, you, you do get more mentality sometimes with people, because they've invested in themselves. Like, this is their shot. They're super fucking grateful. It's what they wanted. And they'll take a shitty role that sucked, kind of, and they'll just grind. So, like, the, the, the certification does well for those types of people, and, and we will place people like that. But, like, look, if, if someone's going to pay us a bunch of money for a close um, you know, usually it's like, unless they're like super newbie, you know, sometimes like closing roles, like if somebody comes to us and, and this is the issue, if, if they're like, hey, okay, I want to hire a closer. And we're like, okay, well, how much is the closer going to make? And they're like six grand a month. It's like, okay, well, you're not going to get a good one. You're going to get a beginner, you know, like no experienced closer, but I want a closer who, who sold seven, seven figures. Well, why would they work for you? I don't know. You know, like they can make six grand. So like, you know, and that happens a lot more in like health coaching or something with offers like for three grand, something like that. So 
if you take out a situation that are like that, if you're like, you know, an established company and, you know, your, your closers can make 15 to 20 grand, you're not going to want somebody with no experience. Now, sometimes people are weird and they do request people from the certification, even for roles like, I mean, you know, if they want them, I'm sure we'll give it to them. But generally, like those people are going to come full cycle recruiting. Now, some people do buy the certification and do have experience. So that that is a little bit of a uh, caveat. And then sometimes there's people who come through with no experience, but they do the training and then like legit in their mouth calls, they get really good. Again, it's a minority. So again, it's not necessarily the training. It's just like, you know, if we're placing, if, some, if, we're, if we're taking somebody's money and placing with somebody, we want to place them with somebody with experience and it generally comes from full cycle. If it's not experience, it comes from the certification a lot of times. It doesn't always work like that 100% of the time. It's not that black and white, but that's generally how it works, if that answers your question. Yeah, no, okay. Thanks very much. Hi, Cole. Can you hear me okay, yeah? Yeah. Can you hear me, yeah? Okay. Uh, my question is, what was the top mistake that you've made in your career, and how did you adapt to it? Huh, yeah, I don't know. Um, top mistake. I mean, it may have been starting two companies, but you know, obviously, I've adapted to it as I, I've already explained. You know, um, that could be the top mistake. Other than that, um, I mean, something that I will say is an issue is. When you bring on certain team members without the right initial conditions, and so like I've lost a lot of good people due to improper expectations from the beginning or unscalable comp structures. So it's like the comp structure, you know, you get you get you give somebody like a variable comp structure, and it makes sense for a while, but then you're doing 2 million a month and this person should be making like 15 grand a month or making 35 grand a month. And it's like, you know, people have super deprival syndrome, loss aversion. So if you change their pay at that point, they're going to quit. So you're kind of just stuck and, and you don't want to tell them like, Hey, it's not worth 35 grand a month. It's okay. But you just kind of screwed up. So like, those are mistakes that suck, you know, is those people mistakes. Um, but yeah, you just really gotta set expectations and sometimes just like, like, you know, if you're not on top of it, sometimes people get unrealistic expectations. Like, you know, I had an EA one time who thought that they should be the C COO of a company. And this person was, came on making $10 an hour, you know, like, but then within a year, they thought that they should be making, um, you know, $300,000 a year, be the COO, they have no experience. And it was completely delusional. They couldn't hire anybody. It was just like, you know, I came from just not managing the first property and setting the right expectations from the beginning. Uh, I had another person very similar who came on making like, like they, they, they came on with zero salary just to, just to prove themselves. Uh, they were making like a grand a month, two grand a month. They were in Egypt. And then this person got really, really good. I poured a lot into this person, but I kind of didn't manage them until the, like, you know, they were there for a year. I didn't really start managing them until the previous six months. The first six months, I kind of was just like, yeah, just get in there and just do some stuff. And, uh, you know, this person just had, like, developed these unrealistic expectations of where they wanted to grow within the company and quit because they didn't get a marketing director. It's like, dude, like, you were legit a VA taking jobs off of her nine months ago, making two grand a month. And like now you're making 10 grand a month, but you're mad you're not getting a three hundred thousand dollar a year position. Like you're not even that good. Uh, but you know, the reason the reason for that is that um quite frankly, it's like I just didn't manage that person well enough from the beginning and set expectations and set a growth track and 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 and, and, and put in systems that like you know um anytime you have somebody so it's like they kind of create their own new position or they go to sole person in the department. You have to set a heavy expectations with that person because they will automatically assume that they're the leader of that department. You need to make sure they know you're the leader of that department and they're just this person. And like, you have to build a team to manage it. And then once you have a few people promote the leader. So it's like, you know, that, that, 
that type of stuff is, a, is, is, is definitely a recurring mistake I've made. And, you know, it was always frustrating because dealing with people who were uh, delusional is very tough. You know, it's like, there's not much you can do. You know, it's like, if you tell them the truth, you shatter their ego. So. Final question. Uh, if you had to start all over again, like right now, what would be the first three things that you would do? Sorry, I didn't hear it. So, if you had to start all over again, like right now, what would, it, what would be the top three things that you would do first? Well, yeah, so do I have money or do I, do, like, is it like, do I still have all of my money or not? Is it he said you've got 100k. Okay, so I'm, I'm basically broke. Um, <laughs> so, um, yeah, what would I do? Well, do I have my skills or no? Yes. So if I, if I have my skills, I mean, dude, I can just whip up a $10 million. Like, you know, if I have my skill sets, I just, you know, whip up a business and at least got my income for like 250 grand a month, 200 grand a month pretty quickly. That would probably, you know, require me to get to six to 800. And then, you know, I'd, I'd figure out if I want to scale that or do something else. But like, yeah, like if I, if I, if all I have is a hundred grand and I have my skills though, or I have my connections, uh, yeah, I would just like reestablish that's all I would do. Um, now, if I already had some money, what I'd probably do is just pursue the bigger billion dollar opportunity to begin with. Um, now, if I didn't have any skills, so there's like different nuances to this question. If I had no skills and no um, knowledge and no money, and I could just, all, all I could do was just send myself back in time and put myself on the right track. What I would do is number one, I would find an industry, and this, I pulled this to a bunch of people, nobody does this. I'd find, this is what I did. I'd find an industry that I'm very passionate about. That's number one. Number two, I would find a three to like $10 million a year company within that industry that's young, disruptive, and growing very quickly. Number three, I would work for that company in a role in which I was able to grow with the company. Sales, marketing, leadership. Okay, one of those. Right? Or maybe product, you know, if it's like a, your coding or something like that. Like in this industry, it's sales, sales, marketing, leadership. But, you know, in other industries, it could be product or research or AI. Yeah, it just depends on the industry. But I, I work and I, I develop high value skills within that industry. Okay, that's that's what I'm really going for here. You want to develop specialized knowledge within that industry, work with that company, and preferably working under some people who can really help you mentor mentor you grow and point out some blind spots. This is what Robert Greene talks about in mastery as the apprenticeship. Now, you want to do that. As long as you're growing in that company, uh, keep growing. At a certain point, if you're not growing, uh, you know, go do something else. Now, if your uh, owner is smart, he'll identify this at a time, and he'll know that like the fish has got to go into a bigger a bigger pond, and then eventually the fish grows bigger and it's got to go into a lake, and then fuck, then it needs a whole fucking ocean, you know? And you gotta just stay ahead of this stuff, right? And you gotta, uh, as the owner, you gotta. Um, you gotta be very cognizant of your people and your human capital and like your assets, right? Like these are your assets. And so uh, like these people can be businesses, you know, like it's like your portfolio in, in a way, right? And so you need to obviously invest in them, treat them right, uh, hear them out, you know, they're sometimes they get emotional, you gotta just let them be emotional. Um, and you gotta understand that sometimes they want things that don't make sense. And uh, you gotta just, um, stay ahead of it and you got to always make sure they have the opportunity that they want. Right. Um, so, you know, and hopefully it's a win-win, right? I mean, obviously if it's not, then it doesn't make sense, but, but yeah, I mean, you know, so if I'm a person working in that company, I would want to see that. I would want to see the fact that like, dude, every time I grow and I hit a cap, this person allows me to have more. Right. Um, 
what people don't want is to feel like they're capped, right? Or, oh, okay, I guess is this what I'm going to be doing for the next 10 years? Same thing, is it? You know, like, so, you know, there just needs to be that, that, that group that answers the question. Awesome. All right, we've got time for one more question. Over to you, Mike. Hey, cool. Um, Mike Diamonds here. I was in your SFA, so I was part of the B2B Amazing. Um, I'm now stuck at 100K, and I'm an influencer with about a million subscribers, right? And can you hear me okay? Mike. Yeah, I can hear you. Right. So I'm stuck at that 100K, just organic. Did you find that to be normal with all the influencers you worked with? And it was ads that they had to use to be able to scale past that 100K a month mark? It was my, it's my first question. Yeah, how many views do you get a video? So, like, it fluctuates, but the channel's generating 2 million views a month. So it's, it's um, um, health and fitness, in the health and fitness space. Yeah, um... Hmm. So should they use ads? I mean, ads is also a little content hamster wheel at times. So, uh, I mean, look, what I would try to do at first is I would continue trying to grow your YouTube. Okay. Cause, cause the thing is that can lead to a lot of other things. And from a, uh, how do I explain this? From an efficiency standpoint, that can give you advantages that ads will never give you. I just have found that like sometimes it's it's tough to. Um, I'm not saying that you should skip. Like what I was saying earlier is, if you're starting from zero, saying I'm going to scale my YouTube as like a source of traffic, that 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 that's easier said than done, right? Uh, now, your stage, if you have a million subs and you're getting a lot of views, I mean, it might make sense to just scale a million a month for scaling your YouTube, right? So, okay, a couple things. Keep scaling your YouTube. And then what I would do is you really got to make sure that how your call to actioning in your videos is getting uh, as many conversions as it should. Now, I don't know how it's, I don't know if we have time to cover that, but like, you know, a lot of times it's just some YouTubers doing like shitty ass call to action like dude, like, like call to action at the beginning of your video or something. Like so that there's that, right? And then make sure there's one call to action. Generally as well, you don't need to send them to a VSL or any of that bullshit. From what I've seen, you just send them right to the application. So, um, and make sure you have an application grading system to where your closures are gonna be able to take the best calls and the ones that are most qualified. And also with the closers, especially with YouTube, man, especially with health fitness, there's a lot of people who, no matter what, they're not going to have money, but it's only going to be worse with ads. So you really got to make sure that your closers know how to actually close people. Health and fitness is actually one of the toughest, like, sales sort of arenas that there is. Um, and a lot of great salespeople come from that background. You know, like Matt Bradder is Jeremy, uh, Jeremy uh, uh, Miner's partner. He uh, is from the fitness space. So is uh, Hormozy, obviously. He is from the fitness space. So, like, you really got to, like, the guy I know who's doing health coaching, who's doing uh, not the 8 million a month guy, but one guy on a webinar is doing 1.5. He's very good at sales. He's a fucking beast. And so there's reasons for that. And so, like, you got to make sure that's good. Now, once all of that is, like, as good as it can fucking be, like the conversion rates are fucking high, like 40%. Uh, you're maximizing your, your lead flow. You have enough sales reps, all that stuff. You have a great system. The, then, then you know you're kind of like max on your YouTube channel. Then what I would do is be like, okay, is it possible for me to grow this rapidly to hit my goals? Or do I have to also do ads in conjunction with this, which could mean at first is retargeting your, the viewers of your channel. And then if, even if you just run small budget on YouTube and or Facebook, oftentimes those, especially on Facebook, believe it or not, that algorithm will find your YouTube subs. Because like, if you think about it, somebody who watches your YouTube channel, if they use Facebook or Instagram, which they probably do, the thumb scroll stop rate is gonna be much higher for your actual subscribers, right? Because they already know like a truck you, so they see an ad, they're like, hey, what is he, what is he doing? 
So in a way, you can run a whole audience on uh, Facebook, okay, an ad. And in a low enough budget, you're actually retargeting your own viewers, even if it's a cold traffic. Does that make sense? It's kind of weird. Yeah. But the algorithm looks from a Facebook Instagram site is that good. Uh, YouTube, I don't know. You know, I know you can retarget your people with your own YouTube ads, but you know, I don't know. So then I start to layer on a little bit of that, right. and then kind of see where you're at at that point. I mean, at least with what I gave you, you should, should be fine. All right, I think that's us wrapped up. Yeah, go on, one more. Uh, Cole, I just wanted to ask about um, stress. You said that you were proper stressful in the recruitment offer and running two companies at the same time, and you kept going about how stressful that was. But then, what kept you going? Was it the mission values thing you talked about earlier, or something else? What kept me going? Yeah. Yeah. Um, just the competitiveness to win. Probably. I just that I just want to win, you know, and so yeah, that I like making money. You know, I, I like our company. You know, I want I want our company to to uh, fulfill the vision that I think it's capable of fulfilling and to reach its potential. Um, but yeah, look, I mean, dude, like at the end of the day, I think what we do raises the standard for the industry in a lot of ways. I think it helps a lot of people. Yes. Uh, I just like to see things hit their potential uh, and be really uh, what they should be and like hit a certain standard. Like it's a lot of a standard thing, you know? So I don't know, like that's just, that's just what it is. Um, but you know, look like at the end of the day, um, you know, that's not like it's like, oh, you know, Elon Musk, you know, hey, let's get somebody on Mars, right? Like that, that's fucking crazy, you know? That's pretty cool. Um, you know, with, 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 with us, like, yes, the vision and mission is important, uh, it's never been something like that, but it doesn't mean that I don't have an insane drive of, and standard of making sure it is as good as it possibly can be. You know, when that chapter of my finally turns and like that's not the focus anymore or something like that. You know, I want to say that it, it, it was maxed the fuck out. You know, like we did as best we could do. The product was as good, the results were as good. You know, it, it's just like a, it's a matter of standards. 